Good to see you this morning. I'm looking forward to tonight, aren't you, for our fish fry, and I hope that you have invited your families and friends and neighbors, and uh, we're looking forward to having a good time of fellowship, fun, and fish. So uh, also I want to make one short, quick announcement here. If you're able, willing to help at all for the uh, fish fry tonight, would you please meet with me back in the kitchen area for a few moments after this morning service has been dismissed? I would like to, to visit with uh, helpers a little bit about our plan of attack on tonight's program. If you have your Bible, open up to the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. <clears throat> we have completed our study in a series of lessons on the book of Titus. We are approaching the month of October, and that is a missions-focused month. And October 7th, we're going to be blessed with Mike Napier. Mike will be here to teach the morning class as well as the morning sermon. I will be in Stillwater during their missions month presenting the report on our recent trip to India. I will be back for October 14th, but we will still have a guest speaker. Uh, that time we're going to have, uh, who's it we're going to have? Kent Markham, that's right. Kent Markham will be here, and he will be talking about the work in Ecuador. Mike, by the way, will be talking about the Gospel Chariot Ministries all across the continent of Africa. And then on the 14th, Kent Markham about the work that's based at Aquito. Uh, Ecuador, where his son has kind of taken the reins now of what he started years ago. So I want you to be encouraged about that. For a couple of Sundays then, I will not be preaching, and uh, therefore uh, this Sunday and next Sunday, I thought I wouldn't start a series. We would do what I sometimes we refer to as a one-off. We won't have a series necessarily until uh, later on in the year. But I do want to talk about something that I think is relevant to us this morning. But I want to start with this narrative, one of my favorite stories from the Gospel of Mark, one of my favorite Gospels. And we begin in verse 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. Verse 37, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Verse 39, he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely, completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. How many of you are from Oklahoma originally? I used to ask it this way, how many of you have lived here all your life? And I had one guy answer, well, not yet I haven't. <laughs> but if you have lived in Oklahoma or Kansas, and I don't say this very loudly, but I'm originally from Texas. We, and we spent a lot of our time too, our family, mom and dad are here. We remember being transferred to Louisiana for seven years of my life. When people ask me where I'm from, I tell them I'm a Tex Cage Okie. 
But we've always lived in places that had the reference given to it, Tornado Alley. How many of you grew up with that phrase? And then just recently, and we're in hurricane season, and just recently we've had a, a couple of hurricanes that I have noted about this year. Lane, that was threatening the Hawaiian Islands. And then, of course, in the last week or two, Florence for North Carolina. And the flooding that's going on there is devastating. Category 4, 140 mile per hour winds. At the last time I checked, uh, there were 24 deaths directly attributed to Hurricane Florence. There were 16 indirectly related to it. $17 billion in damage at the time I checked, uh, just a couple of days ago. Made landfall on the 14th, south of Wrightsville Beach in North Carolina. And flooding is still going on. Uh, this, this past weekend, I think we were very lucky with all the rain that hit Oklahoma. We are far enough north that we didn't have to deal with the six or seven inches falling in one span of an hour south of here in the flooding that's been going on that I have seen. And I'm sure, I'm sure you've got friends like I do on Facebook that's been posting pictures of the running water across roads and road closures and all of that. And it's interesting that storms are markers of location and dates. If I just say May 3rd, we know what we're thinking about, don't we? Uh, all kinds of catastrophes we, we relate to uh, where we were when this happened. And of course, this can be also man-made tragedies. 9-11, that, has a, that resonates something with the, the human fabric, or at least for Americans, that resonates something with us. But in Oklahoma, May 3rd, or we may just say the names of these infamous hurricanes. I remember Andrews, for example, that hit Florida. Hugo, or who could forget Katrina, right? And it just depends where you are. Even for this community, sometimes a frame of rep reference in time, chronologi chronologically speaking, is I'll, I'll hear old timers talk about, was that before the tornado or after the tornado? And we know there's tornadoes all the time, but we know which tornado they're thinking of, right? What was it, 55? 1955 in Blackwell. So when we just say to our friend, uh, was that before the tornado or after the tornado? An innocent bystander may think, what tornado? There's been a hundred this year. We know which one we're talking about or we're hearing about, right? I wasn't born by then, back then, by the way, by that time. <laughs> but we reference to those times, the flood of 27 or or we have a year associated with it. And, and like with May 3rd, we don't even have to know the year. It just, it shows up in our taxes sometimes when we're talking about, were you affected by the May 3rd tornadoes? And there's some others that might be uh, uh, mentioned there. They're markers of time and space for us. And so this morning in this sermon called In the Eye of the Storm, I want us to deal with the fact that Jesus is in our boat. Isn't that a good thing? Now, I will tell you, the last place I want to be in the middle of a storm is in a boat if that storm is out on water. I don't know if you noticed this about Florence, that one of the news stations had this about they had spotted a sailboat that was right in the direct path of Florence. Did y'all see that? Where the sailboat had been out there quite a ways and they had finally made contact with them and say, hey, a storm's coming, you know. And, and there were helicopters and planes flying over. And I'd never heard the end of the story about that boat, but I wouldn't have wanted to be in that boat. But if I was in that boat, I'd want Jesus in it, wouldn't you? You know, I, 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 can, I can handle maybe 15 mile per hour winds in a boat pretty good. When it gets to 20, I like to kind of get closer to shore. If you've been out on Call Lake or any other lake, when it starts white capping and the spray is coming up over into the boat, it can get a little hairy. And it got hairy for these disciples, didn't it? 
I don't know if you're like me. I, I would be thinking, okay, this storm comes up. And it says it was a furious storm there in verse 37. And I don't know, I know what I would do. If, if water is filling up in the boat, I've got two options, bail or walk on water. I've tried the latter one, it doesn't work, so I bail. Uh, Bill and I have an experience, I believe it was you, in uh, Tim's boat. Tim's not here this morning, but we had an experience where my feet started getting wet and the back end of Tim's boat started to sink. Luckily, we were right by the bank, so I knew, I can't walk on water, but I think I can jump that far. But I'm in the back, I know, this is, this is I'm going to be on the bad end of this joke because that's where all the weight was, according to Bill. And it starts filling up in the back. And I see tackle boxes floating. Hey, uh, guys, uh, it's getting wet back here. Bill kind of turned around and Tim turned around. And Tim, of course, it's his boat, so Tim jumped to action. You know, what do we do? I just emptied a tackle box, started bailing, you know? Come on, guys, help us out here. Pull your weight. That's what I'd be doing. But where's Jesus at in this boat? Yeah, what some of y'all are doing right now. You're sleeping. <laughs> Asleep in the stern, right? And I'm thinking, if I had been one of those disciples, I'd be a little upset too. Master, don't you care that we're going to drown? Of course, what Jesus does is just as calm as can be, Wakes up. I, I picture that he stretches a little bit after this nap. And then he says, peace. Be still. And my frustration, my impatience, my disgust at somebody not helping us bail water, and all that composure that might have been on my face, I think would have instantly changed at the moment he said those words. Because the wind died down and it was completely calm. Now with a hurricane, there's an interesting phenomenon that happens. There is an eye of the hurricane called the eye of the storm, right? And for Florence, they had sent up a, a droid to go up there to fly around inside the eye so we get views. I don't know if you saw that or not, but we'd had video footage of how peaceful it was. And all around, all around was the storm raging, but in the center, it was just as calm as could be. And you could look up and see the sun, the daylight's coming through. It was really a, really a, a neat experience to see all of that. But the eye of the storm is the crosshairs of where all the damage is going, where wherever the direct hit is going is where that eye is going to. But I think sometimes when storms of life happen, because this is really an analogy, isn't it, for how we handle and navigate through storms today in our spiritual lives, that the eye of the storm is there for us to get a preview of the fact that in the midst, right in the middle of a storm, Jesus' is Prince of Peace is there with you. I think it's a reminder. I think it's a, 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 great, a great illustration that, remember, I'm still in control, Jesus says. He can calm storms. He can make the wind die down. He can cause the the waves to be calm. And if he can do that with physical storms, don't you think he can do that with your spiritual, mental, marriage storms, family storms, school storms, financial storms? Can Jesus calm your storms? Can I get an amen? amen. And you can say amen because you probably can relate to he has calm storms for me hasn't he? You can look back and see Jesus has never left me. He was always there for me. 
I might have put my vision on the elements instead of Jesus and I got afraid and he's saying, why are you afraid? Remember I said to you earlier on, we're going to go to the other side. Didn't you believe me when I said that? What did Jesus say the last thing he said to his followers before ascending up to be with God in heaven, sitting on his right hand? I will be with you when? Does that include storms? Does that include storms? Does that include storms? Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. The Bible says that. He told us that with assurance. And we can believe that. Now, I agree with what I heard all my life. And you've heard this too because I know I've said this to you. But there's basically three stages of life you're always in. One of these three stages. You've either been through a storm recently. Or you're in the middle of a storm right now. Or one's coming. And it's, it's one of those perfect storms. It's a brewing. You can see it off the coast of your life. But it's approaching your way. And I, I think I agree with it. I think we've all been through storms. And some of us may be in a storm. And some of us, having gone through storms in the past, can identify there's one coming again. It's still hurricane season. And what you and I need to remember is that we have different options of how we respond to the storm. Now, the first option is we can run. Outrun a tornado. I've done that. Well, I mean, drove. I have driven away from a tornado threat that was coming to Blackwell. I started off going to Stillwater because predominantly tornadoes go from southwest to northeast. And it was coming this way. I'm thinking I'm going to go that way. Get on the radio as we're listening to the radio. And Lexi can tell this story better than I can. But they were talking about the tornado has turned. It is now headed to Stillwater. So I turn. I start going to Pawhuska. And then we hear on the radio, the storm's now turning to Pawhuska. I'm thinking, God, what did I do? You're aiming at me. And we get at Pawhuska. And I'm about to go as far as Bartlesville. And I'm thinking, no, I'm gonna, this is going to go this way now. So it had a south energy and it's going east energy. I'm heading north. Guess what? Now it's headed to Coffeeville or it's headed to Ark City. And we came back that way through the storm. I think, it, I think we drove through it actually. All that storm there. They tell you on the news, don't try to outrun a tornado. Don't, don't try to outrun the storm. And we've got an example in the Bible of, of Jonah trying to run away from a storm. Now he... He's not running away when he's on the boat when the storm actually comes, but the call of God to him, I want you to get on Nineveh, his rejection was a storm he created of his own. And when the storm comes up, the men on the boat that Jonah is in, they're throwing things overboard because they're about to drown, they're about to sink, and they've thrown everything they can. And Jonah finally steps forward and says, hey guys, throw me overboard. Well, we don't do that. And he convinces them, this is the only way because God is chasing me. I've been trying to run from him. Throw me overboard. And they threw him overboard. And they said, God, forgive us of this. And the fish that God had prepared swallowed him up. And we know the rest of the story. Got sped out on a bank. Finally convinced him to go to Nineveh and preach. But he tried to outrun a storm. Option number two, you can resist it. You can resist it. Anytime I see these hurricanes, I always hear of, of people who don't, even though the evacuation has been commanded, it's been given, people don't want to leave. Oh, we're going to stay put. We'll do okay. And I know of several examples of stories where people refused to leave that lost their lives because they resisted. The storm's not real or it's not going to be that big of a thing and I'll stay put. How many of you have heard of the story of the guy who drowns because of the flooding and he gets to heaven and he says, God, I thought you were going to take care of me because every time there was somebody coming by before the flooding actually occurred, somebody came by and their truck said, come get in with us. Let's get out of here. We got to leave. And then the water started rising and a boat comes by. One of the neighbors says, get in the boat with us because we got to leave. And finally he had to get up on the roof because the water had gotten that high. You've heard this story before. But the helicopter comes along with a little bullhorn and says, hey, climb up this ladder because you're going to drown. 
And all three times, the guy said to these people that were coming by, that's okay, God will take care of me, God will protect me. All three times, and he drowned, and he died, and he's in heaven. God, I thought you were going to take care of me. God said, I sent you a truck, a boat, and a helicopter. What more did you want? The fact is that we cannot resist the storm. The storm's going to come. I mean, you can do the best you can to shore up and board up the, the, uh, the windows and the doors and batten down the hatches. You can do all that you can do, but it's not going to keep the storm from coming. You can't turn these wind generators around and say, force that wind back. You know, a lot of people really think that that's what's providing the wind in Oklahoma are all the windmills. But the fact is you can't do that. You can't harness it. We know that's true. And I don't know of anything really more devastating than floodwaters. If you've ever been a flood, you know what kind of havoc that wreaks. I, yeah, wind is terrible. And lightning, I've heard it's bad. But floodwaters, there's long-lasting effects there. What about what to do when you're in the eye of the storm? You can run, you can resist, but let me suggest to you the third option, that is to rise. Rise above the storm. I gotta tell you about a, uh, something I've been obsessed about lately. Uh, Jordan and some of the others are gonna laugh at this because I got a new phone recently and I got an app on my phone. Did you know there's such a thing as called the International Space Station? You've heard of that before, okay? And there's an app for that to know when it's passing by your way and it'll tell you, I'll get a notification, hey, it's in the daylight now. See what Earth looks like. In case you forgot, you can go and see the NASA television view. And, and sometimes it'll say, hey, in the next couple of minutes, the ISS is going to be viewable in your area. Landon, I took him out on the country road one night. I got that notification. By the time I got out there, it had already passed because the thing is moving at 27,000 something kilometers per hour. It's crazy fast. I mean, it actually is when you're seeing it in the horizon. It's just moving like, how many of you have seen this visible to the eye, by the way? Kind of a neat thing, isn't it? And I kept telling everybody in my family that I, I see it on the phone and I can go outside and I can see the horizon. I can see where it's supposed to be. And it's usually been passing over this way like that in our area. I saw it the other night <laughs> after three or four failed attempts. Because the first time I got the app, it was cloudy all the time. I couldn't do that. And then the other times, it was just so dark, you just can't see it. But somehow, it still catches the sun's reflection that you can't see for at least a few moments. And I'm out there grilling on the grill, and I get this notification. Okay, yeah, right. This is like the 12th time. And I look up, and there it is, just for a couple of seconds. By the time I went into the house to get everybody, it had disappeared. So nobody still believes me. But anyway, what's that got to do with the United States storm? There was a view from the International Space Station of Hurricane Florence. This is, I mean, it looks pretty actually when you look at it and you saw the center in the eye of the storm right there. And you could tell it's from the space station because you can see some of the solar panels in the shot and stuff, but a beautiful blue earth with a white cloud swirling. And it reminded me of something. It's better to see it from above than in the middle of it, isn't it? And to think that what they could look down and see as this hurricane, and they see them all the time, right? It reminds us of the view God has, and it's even a better view, isn't it? To rise above the storm. For, for when you rise above the storm, you get God's perspective. And he sees the bigger picture. And the thing that you'll be reminded of, of from God's perspective is this is temporary. It's moving. Yes, you're going to have to endure it. And it rains on the just and the unjust. The Bible says that. I know that. But you're going, to, you're going to go through this for a little bit, but there's an end to it. This will pass. It will. There'll be an end. You see God's perspective. And you also see God's peace in it. Even from the view of the International Space Station, you'll see that hole in the center where it's peaceful and calm. And it should remind us anytime we see a picture or an image like that, that God has a peace for you that transcends all understanding in the middle of your storms. You get God's perspective, God's peace, and you get God's perseverance. Look at Proverbs chapter 10 with me in verse 25. Proverbs 10, 25 says... When the storm has swept by, some Bibles say when the storm comes, 
When the storm has swept by, the wicked are gone. But the righteous stand firm forever. The righteous stand. They know how to stand in the storm because they've got God on their side. Jesus is in their boat. You get God's perseverance. James chapter 1 tells us that when we count it all joy for trials, it's because of the fact the trials bring perseverance, and perseverance completes its work in our lives. So that diagnosis, that financial crisis, that loss of perhaps a, a baby, a child, or of a parent or grandparent, the loss of a spouse, or the loss of a job, or other crisis in your life that's wreaked havoc in your life in the past or maybe now or you see it coming. I want you to remember the words to this song we're about to listen to. It's a song that we're going to be learning hopefully uh, in a month or two. And it's a song that's done by the Acapella Praise and Harmony group. Jordan has done some recording with this. Meredith Harden has done some recording with this. And I think she's on this recording. But we're going to listen to a song. And you're going to see the words on the screen. I don't want you to think about maybe storms that you've encountered in your life. When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet Between the black skies and the red eyes I can barely see if I realize I'm a soul now by my friends or my family, I can feel the rain reminding me in the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guide my soul, you are the future I picture slowly fade away, and when the tears of pain and heartache are pouring down my face, I find my peace in Jesus' name, in the eye of the storm, you remain in control, in the middle of the war, you guard my soul. this morning for you. But I've got a question for you. Is Jesus in your boat? You need to get in the boat Jesus is in. Get him into your boat, into your life. And this morning we're going to stand and sing a song. 
And you can take that step forward to step into the boat with Jesus by being buried with him in baptism, baptized in water for forgiveness of your sins. If you're already a Christian, maybe you just need to be reminded. You need to be tapping Jesus on the shoulder and say, Jesus, help me. And he will because he can control storms. He'll calm yours this morning. Why don't you come as we sit and sing? I cannot today what tomorrow may bring.